Excel's going. Right. Uh, I that is my error, Sarah. I had said I would let you know we were going to record this. Um, I it's good to remind other people, but um, if you have objections to that, you should let me know. But it's good for us to keep it as a archival. Well, sometimes we will use shots of them for <coughs> some sort of video or on the website, but just short little scripts. But oh, sure, yeah, no, it's a great resource because I know people have a lot going on in their their schedules, and so if if somebody can't make it today, they would be able to get the information later. So I'm totally comfortable with that. And I'm I'm glad to use that as my segue to introduce Sarah Reader, who um, is a certified nice person and also a certified appraiser of antiques. Um, she she is, um, got certifications from two out of the three um, international appraisal groups. And that's because she thought she didn't need the third. She could get it easily, we know that. And she has worked previously at, um, and studied with and um, done work for the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, and um, at, at Colonial Williamsburg. Um, but that doesn't mean she doesn't know her mid-century modern as well. And she's, she's um, certainly worked in, in more recent, um, but still collectible and valuable um, uh, periods. Um, I invite all of you who have burning questions that you want to make sure we get into to um, uh, put them into the chat. Um, and uh, I will I will try and monitor that as we go forward and through through things. Um, I'm going to suggest as Sarah's going to speak. It, we, then when we get to the question and answer, I'll I'll just use your hand up visually. Um, if you know how to use the hands up signal on on the Zoom, that's fine. I'll I'll be on the lookout for that too. But with that, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to um, Sarah. <laughs> And she'll be sharing sharing her screen at some point, um, and I'll be watching the Zoom. I will not interrupt for your questions, but I'll I'll try and make sure we get we address them when we get to the end. So thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate you speaking to the Capitol Hill Village um, members and and our friends who have joined us. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. That was that was just so flattering to hear. So thank you for that. I will go ahead and share my screen now. And then there'll be plenty of time at the end if any of you have any questions. So if there's something I don't cover in my presentation, rest assured you can have the chance to ask me when I finish. So I'll go ahead and share now. Can everybody see this all right? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So my presentation is Praising Art and Antiques, and I am an appraiser of art and antiques. And uh, as Bruce mentioned, I'm a certified member of the Appraisers Association of America, which is the AAA here. And then I'm also a certified member of the International Society of Appraisers, which is the mm -hmm. ISA cap part of that. So if you're wondering what all those letters mean, that's, that's the, how they do their designations. And my company is called Artifactual History. So welcome. The art and antiques in our collections can add great joy to our daily lives. And as an appraiser, it's always such an honor to be able to help clients deepen their understanding of these items. And so uh, today, some of the topics that I'm going to be talking about are what an appraiser's job is really like compared to what we see on TV. Spoiler, spoiler alert, it's pretty different. Different levels of value for different types of appraisals situations that prompt appraisals and the different types of appraisal reports, because there actually are many different types of appraisal reports, how to determine if you uh, have uh, current insurance coverage that's sufficient to protect your items, because I find a lot of people in this area do, and then how to communicate to family members about which heirlooms are most special to you. So first off, I'm gonna start with the part that I personally feel is most important, which is just loving what you live with. As an appraiser, I have to deal with the financial side of value and monetary uh, aspects to art and antiques. But what I find personally is most important is that people surround themselves with objects that bring them joy, which could be totally independent of what their current place in the market is. I like to explain that the art and antiques market is kind of like the fashion world where every so often the, the powers that be decide that everything you know is out of style and something new has to come in just to get people to 
go buy more things. And uh, that often is very similar, unfortunately, to what the art and antique market is like, that things come in vogue, they come out of vogue, and it really has nothing to do with the inherent beauty or, or just joy that a piece could bring you. So I always ground my work, even though I have to deal in the financial realm of value for, for my legal responsibilities to clients, with loving what you live with. And that can be totally independent of the market and really should be. So I like to start with that because that is really where my perspective is grounded. And then uh, next, I'm going to go to pop culture uh, perceptions of appraisers versus the reality of being an appraiser because they are quite different. So uh, this slide here has excerpts from an article I wrote a couple of years ago for Worthwhile Magazine, which I'm actually co-founder and co-editor of. I co-founded it in 2018 with my good friend, Cartney Alstrom Christie, who's an appraiser based in Georgia. And my article, which you can all read later if you're curious, it's linked from my website and it's also on Worthwhile Magazine was titled, Not Like on TV, Appraising is a Professional Service Like Law or Accounting, because I'm sure we've all seen before those really interesting shows on TV, which are very fun to watch. I, I find them interesting, <laughs> although now I, I know too much and I kind of can't quite sit through them, but that what we see on TV as appraising is so different from the full context of appraising. It's a, a slice of it, but it's very much interesting slice and it leaves out all of the work. So this is an excerpt from my article and it uh, was a part of the article where I actually compared what we see on TV with what an appraiser might actually do for the same item. So this is a painting that's being evaluated and it's, you know, the, the two minutes on TV and then what uh, for uh, an appraiser like myself, the work that we actually do to, that goes into the, that in valuation conclusion for what you see on TV. So this is uh, one of the things that uh, is really not very widely known about the appraisal profession, just how involved it can be. So just to give a, a sense of when I go on site and inspect items, each item that gets included in an appraisal is I look at it carefully, I write a condition report for it, noting areas of damage, I measure it and record the dimensions, I do take notes for an item description, which I then will expand on and, and write a full item description later back in my office, and I photograph it. And so I have uh, an overall photograph, the artist's signature, any areas of damage, the verso of the painting, and for other object types as well. I'm just using a painting as an example. And then that's all just on site and back in the office. Then all of that data, my photographs get downloaded. I put that into my report, which is a very specific format that the Appraisers Association of America has designed for their members as, as a quality standard. And then I start doing the research. So it may, depending on the level of the market, which I will get to in a minute, there are many different levels of the market. I may be looking at gallery listings for available paintings by this artist, or I may be looking at auction sales for paintings by this artist or calling galleries to try to get their private pricing because many galleries don't like to actually say what something could be purchased for. So it's, it's and also determining, is this painting even right? Because sadly, there are a lot of, of works circulating out there that are not what they purport to be. I attended the International Society's, Society of Appraisers Conference this last weekend and I got to see a presentation by my friend, actually, Doug Bort, who is an art detective. And he uh, cited the statistic that it's estimated that 40% of the items circulating in the art market right now are not actually what they say they are, which wow. is a pretty staggering statistic. But I, I have to say that from what I have seen out there, I, I think it's probably not that far off. And so that's another thing that it makes it really complicated for, for doing our job, because while appraisers actually are not authenticators, that's, that's a, often I get, uh, you know, inquiries on can, uh, can you authenticate this item? And I explained that appraisers aren't authenticators. Authenticators are an entirely different field, but we often have to coordinate with authenticators because if some, you know, an item that we are appraising is, ha you know, has some question about whether it's authentic. So that that's a whole different complication, <laughs> but this is why it ends up being, I mean, I, I, really respect the interest that so many of these popular shows have raised in our field and art and antiques and you know it's really 
they've been great for developing collectors, but I, I would love if just for, you know, five minutes, every episode, they'd show the boring parts <laughs> just so people <laughs> know that they're there <laughs> because there's so much boring content that nobody wants to watch. I totally understand that, but just to let people know we're leaving out all of the boring part for your entertainment purposes. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, there's uh, that appraiser life is, is really rather different than people think it is. And then uh, moving forward, I mentioned different levels of the market. And so that's another thing that frequently is not widely known. People think, okay, what's the value? And an appraiser will say, well, what, what's the intended use? Because there is no such thing as one value. The same object can have many, many different values simultaneously on the same day, depending on which level of the market. So um, value is, is this amorphous concept that has to be contextualized with the level of the market and with a specific moment in time. So that specific moment in time is called the effective date. And every appraisal report has an effective date, which is either the date of inspection, like with an insurance appraisal, it's documenting the item looked like this when the appraiser was there, or for state purposes, the effective date is usually related to a, a date of death, or for donation, it's the date of donation. So that, that day is so critical because something hugely important could happen <laughs> Day, and then that value would be different. So I actually created this, this graphic a couple of years ago. And this is, I based it off the food pyramid. So I figured that's something people are familiar with. So it's the value pyramid of the levels of the market. And so it at the very top is retail. And that's usually the most expensive uh, monetary level. So retail basement value is often used for insurance appraisals. And an example of retail replacement value would be for that painting I was talking about, uh, what is the gallery that represents the artist asking as the retail asking price for a painting, which may not be what they actually sell that painting for down the road. We may negotiate, but for the purposes of making sure that uh, an insurance appraisal client is protected in the event of damage or loss, I can't assume that that gallery is going to negotiate that day. So what they say is the retail asking price would be the retail replacement value. And so that could be a lot of money. That's usually quite expensive. And then moving down the actual cash value that is sometimes used with insurance appraisals. I find it's very rarely used for art and antiques. It's more things like washing machines where it's a retail replacement value minus depreciation for age. So if it's a 10 year old washing machine, the insurance company isn't gonna give you the brand new washing machine settlement. But for art and antique appraisers like myself, that's usually not something that we are ever using because we're, we're not appraising washing machines, but that is a level of the market that for other categories of items is pretty widely used. And then next is fair market value, which is kind of another one of the big levels that's frequently used. Retail and fair market are the ones that I use most frequently in my firm and most of my colleagues who are appraisers do too. So fair market value is used in appraisals for federal functions like estate tax, like a non-cash charitable contribution. And that is defined by the IRS and treasury regulations. And it's a open market, willing seller, willing buyer. And it's often based on auction hammer price plus buyer's premium and not always, but most frequently. And so that could be a lot, you know, substantially less than the retail replacement value. And I know some of you are probably auction veterans. So you're very familiar with hammer price and buyer's premium. But for those of you who aren't, the easy math example I like to use is that say you're at an auction and you decide you want to bid on something and then you're the winning bidder and the auctioneer goes sold and hammers down the gavel, you know, $400 to bidder number one, assuming you're bidder number one. That's, that does not mean you can pick up that item and leave the auction house without somebody tackling you if you only pay $400 because the auction houses have a, their own buyer's premium. Not only do they charge consigners for the, you know, the, that selling uh, service, but they also charge buyers for, for what's called a buyer's premium. And most buyer's premiums are around 25%. So if you were bidder number one who bought that item for a hammer price of $400, you're probably going to be paying something that's closer to $500 in order to actually be able to leave the premises with that item. And so that's, it's really important to add buyer's premium into fair market value because that is one of the things that is specific in the IRS definition. And then next is liquidation value, which 
I don't use that much in my firm. It's really uh, for uh, for sales, bankruptcy sales, rushed auctions, or estate sales. And so that's a situation where somebody calls and says, I need to sell this, this item by next week. And so they're going to be taking a huge discounting because of that speed where they're not really appropriately marketing it. They're not reaching the people who are collectors of that item. And so that is one of the very lowest levels of the market and really is more reflective of the, the very compressed time frame than any inherent qualities in the object. So this is there, there actually are even more sub levels of the market, but these are the, the major ones to be aware of. And then just as a summary, some of the different levels of value, retail replacement, that's usually a lot of money. It's used for things like insurance and moving so that you'll be protected in case the movers break anything. And then fair market value, it's usually less money used for things like estate, equitable distribution. And just this is a hypothetical, but to give you a sense of just how different these two levels of the market can be for the same item, often I will see, a, for example, a painting that on at a gallery, it may be listed for a retail uh, asking price of $10,000. On the auction level of the marketplace, I sometimes it's really fun. I can go back and see when that painting that the gallery purchased was offered and they picked it up at auction for maybe a thousand dollars. So it's it's not really the traditional double it retail markup that people think of. It can be much, much more depending on the object and and the venue. And so these are just a, it's a kind of a quick overview of situations that may prompt appraisals. Often, most people don't need appraisals. You know, they, it's, there's certain circumstances where people aren't uh, protected, but uh, oftentimes they are. And so my goal always in my firm is to help people, you know, determine, are they good? And if they don't need me, that's wonderful. They're, they're good. So just to give people the peace of mind, that's really my goal. And so insurance appraisals, insurance purposes, that may be a situation that some people need. And so your insurance agent may tell you, you need a new or updated appraisal to retain your coverage. Sometimes people call me up and they, they say, well, my insurance agent told me they're not gonna renew my policy unless I get an updated appraisal because uh, insurance companies like to get updates every three to five years. Or you may realize that your current policy leaves you vulnerable in the event of loss without having certain items scheduled in an itemized appraisal report. And actually on my website, I wrote a whole article about how to tell if you need an insurance appraisal a couple of years ago. So if that's something you're curious about, I have a lot more detail if you wanna go into the weeds about that. Another situation is for estate planning. I have a lot of clients actually that they uh, engage me to do an insurance appraisal, mainly to catalog their collections. It's, you know, some items they're gonna schedule, but they'd like to have uh, a illustrated catalog of their collections so that their children know exactly which things are important. And I, I'm always very clear with the clients that it's the wrong level of value. As we spoke about before, for estate planning, you really, fair market value is the applicable level. And for insurance, it's gonna be an appraisal retail replacement value. But the main thing that those clients want with the full knowledge, it's the wrong level of the value or the wrong level of the market is they're looking for that illustrated catalog of their collection, which you know can be very, very helpful for families. So having one's collection illustrated that way uh, I, it's a big fear that people say, oh, you know, my son is going to throw out something important because he doesn't know or that that prevents that kind of situation from happening because they literally have this illustrated roadmap of what's important and what to be careful about. Then estate purposes, have, depending on where one is located and how one's paperwork is set up, sometimes a family's attorney may advise that an estate appraisal is needed. And it could be for a variety of situations like federal state tax, state state uh, state tax, probate, or just setting up the stepped up basis for heirs. And so appraisers never uh, give any advice on that. We, you know, I, I am not qualified to give advice on that. That's something that needs to come directly from the family's estate attorney or accountant. Then estate equitable distribution purposes. This is sometimes when uh, they, family doesn't actually need anything for a legal purpose, but if there is a little bit of conflict in the family, it can be really, really helpful to have someone who's objective and independent help, uh, you know, give an impartial opinion of value for certain items so that they can be peacefully divided uh, among the heirs and in a fair way. And that allows everybody to feel like they've had their needs properly represented and that in the, if there's a dominant sibling that that dominant sibling hasn't unfairly distributed things. So 
I like it when my clients aren't yelling at each other, but I, I am sad to say that that doesn't always happen. <laughs> Sometimes they finish yelling at each other before I get there. So that's ideal, but <laughs> that is that actually can be very useful to engage an appraiser if, if there is uh, some sort of tension within a family. And then moving purposes, which is more or less insurance, but it's insurance for that uh, very specific purpose of making sure things, if things do get destroyed in a move, that you're going to be properly protected and get a settlement that's commensurate with the value. And this, especially in DC, uh, there's, I find there's a lot of that with the international uh, diplomatic and military community. And I have found anecdotally that nothing will inspire care and concern and strike fear in the hearts of movers than having a client say, I just had this appraised. <laughs> so it often can be helpful just, just for that. And then I wanted to talk quickly about qualified appraisals. And qualified appraisals is really a term that the IRS and the government uses frequently. And uh, qualified appraisals are USPAP compliant. And you may be saying, well, what is USPAP? USPAP stands for Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, which is a mouthful. So everybody calls it USPAP. And it started in the 80s after the savings and loan crisis. And it's a, a body of uh, regulations for appraisers that was originally for real estate appraisers, but now it has spread to all the different appraisal fields, including personal property like myself, which is great. And every two years, uh, an appraiser has to take a seven hour USPAP update. Initially, we have to take a 15 hour USPAP class and pass an exam, which was actually a very hard exam because I memorized the entire USPAP manual, but it wasn't about the content at all. It was applying USPAP to very specific and arcane situations and how to apply it. So it was actually a very hard exam. And, but now, since I passed that, now every two years, I have to take my seven hour update, which I just took earlier this month. And all any of you for any category that you'll ever be having appraised, make sure that the appraiser you work with is USPAP compliant because it's a, a protection for you as the consumer. And so USPAP compliant appraisers have to pledge that they have no past, present, or future interest in the items being appraised. And also their fee schedule has to be hourly or project rate, not contingent on the appraised values because as outrageous as this sounds, it was a common practice in the 1980s for appraisers to say that their fee schedule was XYZ percentage of whatever the appraised values were, which they were in control of, of determining. So that, yeah, that led to all kinds of problems. And to this day, I still see the appraisers or client will say, oh, you know, my parents had this appraised and they pull out this 1980s appraisal with just these uh, uh, incredible values on there. And I, I, I sometimes wonder if, if those values, which bear no reality to any level of market ever, whether that was perhaps influenced by that appraiser's uh, fee structure. So definitely always work with a USPAP compliant appraiser, whether it's for jewelry appraisal, or, and I don't appraise jewelry, by the way, I'm not a certified gemologist. I tell people I like jewelry, I don't appraise jewelry, but just whoever you ever work with, make sure they're USPAP compliant. And I also wanted to uh, highlight this illustration here because the China market has not been performing with great strength over the last couple of years, but certain patterns are real outliers, and this is one of them. So if you ever see this, find this in an estate sale, you know, have this in your personal collection, be careful because this is Royal Copenhagen's Floridanica pattern, and this can sell for $1,000 a plate. <laughs> So most of the Royal Copenhagen I see are the Christmas plates, which sell for more you know, like 10 to $25 a plate. But this particular pattern has a, a cult following. It's hand painted. It's really, really exquisitely made. And these, mm -hmm. anything Floridanica sells very, very high. So never, and that's part of what is so complicated about what we do. There are broad generalizations about the market but everything has to be specifically researched. And then there are these outliers like Floridanica that are just, you know, hugely expensive. And so it, it, it's actually very meticulous and fiddly what we do. And so this just, I wanted to give you a sense of, this is a real table of contents page from one of my reports. This was an estate appraisal report I did last year. And this, this is that it's, you know, it's a hundred, it was 153 pages long. So uh, I've, I've omitted anything here that would identify the client, of course, because we also are regulated like banks. So we have a, a really strict 
uh, level of confidentiality that we are bound by for our clients. But this is a real page from one of my appraisal reports. So I have a title page, the table of contents, my appraiser's use PAP certification, where I'm pledging that I have no past, present, or future interest in the items. Uh, the uh, my qualifications, so my CV goes in every report. Why was I qualified to appraise these items? The scope of work, which is an appraisal specific term that I like to describe it as the recipe for an appraisal. It says, you know, who was this for? What was it for? What level of value did the appraiser use? You know, what what were the items that were appraised, and what were the conditions? Did I see it in person? Did I work with photographs? So the scope of work is really important too you know, help somebody who's using the report figure out what, what happened to generate this document. The total fair market value, so in that I added everything up that was appraised in this estate, market analysis, which is a more general essay about the state of the market, then the inventory, and so the inventory includes all of the items that were appraised with their cataloging, their fair market value, individual fair market value, and their photographs. Then, uh, you know, statements, indemnifications, and disclaimers, where did I get my data from, some of the databases I used, and then a glossary of terms. So it's, it's a whole lot more than the two minutes that you see on TV. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I could do the two minutes. That would make my job so much easier. But in order to prepare a legal document that is going to serve the needs of the client, it's, it's, this is what most appraisal reports by USPAC compliant appraisers look similar to this. Then uh, just a little bit of tips if you're wondering if you ever need an insurance appraisal report in the future. I put these pictures in as joke because these are actually all in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They're very, very nice pieces. Like this is a very rare Tiffany piece right here. So this hypothetical client would definitely need an insurance appraisal report. So how to tell if you're protected. Easiest thing is you can well, read your policy document, but that, that can be very fiddly. I, I've read my policy document and thought, wow, it's no wonder no one knows what their scheduling threshold is when they call me up. Easiest way is just call your insurance agent. I've never had anyone say, my insurance agent wouldn't talk to me about my policy. And you don't have to commit to anything, but just ask them to explain what is your current coverage and then confirm your scheduling threshold. That's the thing that as appraisers, we really need to know because that's the number that anything that is over that needs to be scheduled in an itemized insurance appraisal in order to get sufficient coverage in the event of damage or loss versus if it's under that, your blanket, it can be counted against your blanket. So you may have an insurance blanket coverage of you know a certain number of thousands of dollars and any item that's under the scheduling threshold can just be applied towards that blanket. But say if your scheduling threshold is $5,000 fair market or retail replacement value, and you have a $25,000 painting, you're not going to get that $25,000 in the event of loss. You'll get, you know, the $5,000 since your scheduling threshold. So the $25,000 painting would be uh, well suited to appraise for insurance versus your $2,000 painting you probably wouldn't need to have that appraised for insurance because that could count against your blanket. So it gets very, very complicated sometimes, sadly. And that's where I always say, call your agent because they it's their job to go through all those details with you. And then if you're thinking ever about having an appraisal prepared, you think about the scope of work. Sometimes people call me up and say, I want everything in my house appraised. And I tell them, I don't think you want to pay me to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> then the budget, uh, does the amount of money you want to spend fit with the volume of items you want to have appraised? Often I, I work with clients very collaboratively in, in my firm to design a scope of work together. So that way, sometimes we just do a capsule appraisal of their highest priority items, and that's really all they need. Or sometimes people, they just really want the to totality of their collection appraised so that they have a, a full catalog for their family. And, you know, that's, I, we're always happy to do that too. That's, it, it's a very collaborative design with the client so that it meets their goals and their needs. The time is our hard deadline. As you probably have figured out from what I've been saying, it takes us a lot of time to finish the research. So make sure that if you have a hard deadline that you reach out to an appraiser uh, early enough that they have the uh, sufficient amount of time to do that research to complete the turnaround. And then goals, you know, why do you want this appraisal? What's your desired outcome? Sometimes people will say, well, I'm just curious because if it's expensive, I may sell it. And I usually in those situations tell people that it probably is not going to be make sense for them or financial sense to actually invest in that if they just want to sell it. Because in many cases, the market 
is going to tell, tell people what the market is, you know, is willing to pay. So it's, it's very, if, you know, it's always a good idea to have your specific outcome in mind. If you decide this is a road you want to go down, ways to prepare, locate and gather relevant uh, receipts, provenance documents, uh, gather any relevant family oral history. Often I have people tell me, oh, I wish, you know, I talked to my mother about this. She knew everything, but, you know, I, I don't know it now. And so that's a, a big thing that I always try to encourage people. Whatever is known now, document it, because at least then that will be known in the future. And so that's something I'm, I'm really, really passionate about. And then uh, I like to close with what matters most, in my opinion, which is also kind of what I opened with, but uh, sharing, you know, loving what you live with and also sharing the sacred memories. Like often in, in my own, uh, you know, personal property world, some of the things that are most precious to me have very little monetary value. I, I'm like the cobbler's children when it comes to appraising, but the, it doesn't need to be expensive to be precious. And so I always really, really support uh, clients in, in not feeling like they have to tie the emotional worth of, item, of an item with its financial worth. And so to me, it's far more important to share why something's important to you with a loved one. So I always encourage people to document. You know, it's really easy now with our smartphones. You can write down or video record your memories about items that are precious to you, explaining exactly why, and also to communicate, you know, so that people... Uh, often I work with a lot of children, adult children who are just kind of distraught and they say, well, I know that my parent really, really loved this and this was really important to her, but I don't know why. And so they find themselves kind of paralyzed about what to do about it because they, they don't have the data they need to make a, a grounded decision. And so I always view it as a gift you can give your loved ones of, of communicating those important things in a, in a positive and proactive way so that people really uh, know what to do and feel like they're, they're going to be uh, executing your, your goals and your, you know, what you would want them to do. So that's a really important thing to think about. And then I, this is how you reach me. Always feel free to, to reach out to me in the future. I'm always happy to answer questions about items. You know, not everybody needs an appraisal, but sometimes it just is helpful to <laughs> run something by an appraiser or get the peace of mind that maybe you don't have to worry about something. I always hate giving bad value news, but it, it's kind of amusing occasionally when I uh, explain that the current market for a certain item is not, not quite at the point it was before. Somebody says, oh, thank goodness. I always hated that piece, but I never felt like I could get rid of it because it was so expensive. So, you know, it, it's surprising what it can be liberating information. So yeah, always feel free to reach out to me in the future and I will turn it back over to Bruce and questions now. There you go. I have to unmute myself. I hope I am unmuted and I hope we will go back to uh, a full, go to full screen showing everybody. Let's see. There we go. Thank you. Um, I don't know whether you did that, Sarah, or Mary Bloodworth did. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so that was great. I, I'm fascinated to find out that there is a cult of China pattern followers. <laughs> um, um, so that, that is great. And um, your last point about sharing sacred memories, as you and I talked about before we got started here, I, I would... Um, let people on this Zoom know that one of the things we found um, by chance uh, ourselves for our upcoming auction is a woman who does exactly that capturing of sacred memories um, with pictures of the object. And then she gets the family stories in there so that you've got a um, electronic capture of that um, to use for insurance purposes, for giving to an appraiser, 10 years from now after the, the memory maker is gone or, or for whatever purposes it may be to share with the rest of the family. That's a fantastic um, resource. And, and she's donating a half day of her time as well as a year's worth of subscription to her to that archiving service uh, on our auction website. So take, you can't bid yet, but go ahead and take a look and you'll find out more about that. I'm looking at my chat to see if we've got any questions posed. 
Um, while I, I wonder if there's anybody with hands up that's got a particular question. I see Liz Gregg. You can unmute yourself, Liz, I believe. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your expertise, Sarah. This has just been a quick run through of a really interesting topic and a wonderful overview. Um, for those of you who are on the call today, I wanna to briefly introduce myself. I'm the Director of Care Services. Um, and I just started um, at Capitol Hill Village within the last couple of months. So it's great to see some of your faces. Um, although right now, the only face I can see is Bruce Brennan, Sarah Reeder, and Peggy Rainwater. So hello. Um, I have a question. How often do you recommend an appraisal be done? I have had one um, about uh, 30 years ago when I inherited a bunch of um, furniture. I had another one done about a decade ago. And I do have a rider on my insurance um, because of the items that I have. And um, how often do you recommend that information be updated? Sure. There is my answer about what I personally recommend. There's what the insurance companies recommend and then kind of in between, which is most practical. So insurance pol uh, insurance companies, they like to say every three to five years. Oh my. I find <laughs> that that can be a little bit, you know, rapid. The key thing is really, has the market changed substantially? Because certain object types have a very stable and static market. And so the, the retail replacement value 30 years ago may not really be that different from where it is now. And I also, uh, depending on your insurance company, often they have, uh, you know, the, an incremental increase each year to, to the premium. So they kind of have that inflation value built in, which is both a good thing and a bad thing because sometimes they're having that inflation value and the object's value is not changing <laughs> as, as they're saying it is. So that might be a reason, it is a good reason to have an update of your appraisal. But I like certain categories like emerging artists, they can be very volatile. I've worked with clients where they purchased uh, an artwork I think five years before for very little money. And then that artist's market just exploded. And so they were like $300,000 underinsured. <laughs> so in that case, it was a really good thing. I was working with them. Although I don't think they liked their premium change afterwards very much, but they were very vulnerable in the event of loss. But for other object categories where, you know, it may be $10,000 25 years ago, and it's $10,000 today, that probably is not uh, a situation where you're very vulnerable. I Most clients come to me when their insurance agent kind of kicks them off the policy unless they get an update. Because uh, yeah, when people say, I had an insured, it's usually an appraisal that is about as old as I am. <laughs> they pull out and show me. So I would say uh, the key thing is really, it has the market changed substantially for the item. So yeah, I'm happy to take a look at it and review and let you know if it looks like you're, you're vulnerable in any items. But otherwise, if your insurance company is letting you keep that on file, you, you know, just <laughs> keep on flying under the radar with it. Sounds good. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you uh, for introducing yourself, Liz. She's already, uh, many of you that have interacted have already shown how she's Swimming, 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 right, right in, in the yep. village current. Is, I'm really trying to attend activities. And if you all recommend certain things that I should be present at so I can get to know lots of members, please let me know. I'm trying to attend a couple things a week. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks for attending today. I appreciate it. Um, let's, I'm also not seeing too many faces. Um, or, or hand. So I guess if you put it in the chat to let me know you'd like to speak or just unmute yourself. Either of those things. I don't see how I can unmute everyone at once, unfortunately, which I would be mine in the case I would do. But while uh, we're waiting for me to find someone who's got something to say, why don't you tell us about your most surprising good discovery and then maybe the most disappointing. <laughs> I think my most surprising good discovery, uh, I will preface this with, this is one, one story out of, uh, you know, six years in business, but, and it almost never happens, but I had a client about five years ago where it was a family and they had an estate and it was 
kind of a, a very sad situation. And so I was called out and I went with the family through this house, which was packed full of items. You know, the, the boxes were hot, taller than I was. And so I'd spent about three hours in the house with a family trying to go through everything and almost nothing was, you know, more than just kind of being beautiful for its intrinsic decorative value and then they said well there's a storage unit too and part of me was like oh my gosh there's a storage <laughs> unit <laughs> yeah because <laughs> I was already about three and a half hours into this but so we all went to the storage unit and then the storage unit you know you open it up it's just cubically filled to the ceiling and it was all artwork and it was a um, the dead of winter and it was you know one of those that was climate controlled but not really which meant it was about 40 some odd degrees there and there was no light and so we pulled all these artworks out into the hallway to this shaft of light uh through a little safety window and i i basically said i'm gonna have to photograph these and research them because there i couldn't even really see what i was doing at that point so i took photographs of of the paintings and their signatures and the leader back in my office i realized one of the paintings was actually by a really significant artist in uh, not an American artist, but someone who was significant in a different country. And it, uh, it was a really, really great painting. And so the family was actually eventually able to sell it. And I think it, it sold for over $50,000, which was great news for the family. So that, you know, there was something that was significant that really was, you know, made a big difference for them. But okay. I mean, it certainly you know, paid for those storage fees, didn't it? Yeah, certainly <laughs> did. But that, and it's, it was the needle in the haystack situation. There were probably a hundred some odd paintings in the storage unit. And I'd already been through the house for three hours, which was full of things, which, you know, there was really nothing of that. Sadly, they were going to be able to sell at that level of the market other than that. But there was this one painting. And so, again, it underscores why what we do is so fiddly and meticulous, but also that sometimes there really are those amazing situations that can be have a life changing outcome for someone in a positive way. I see Liz had her hand up as well. Cynthia has her hand up, too. Oh, good. Go, go ahead to Cynthia. OK. I have some items that, thank, hi Liz, how are you? Hi, um, Cynthia. I have some items that I'm thinking about contributing to the auction. And I'm trying to best figure out how to determine what I, how to determine what the current value is and to est or estimate the value. I love you, Cynthia. Um, this is, here's a, an example. I have some white Limoges charger plates. Bruce, here's a question for you. Which level of the market are uh, things getting documented for, for, for the auction? Is it fair market value or retail replacement level value? Uh, fair market value, as if it is an, it, it, it's a charity auction, but it, we, we list there, we determine, Determine the value, and this might be really t telling Ms. Barrow how she can best take a look at these things, because I know you're not here to do a, uh, a, a an impromptu um, uh, auction estimate. But yeah, we we we, we do what their um, what an auction estimate would be. Um, so, and I guess what I would say is my when I get stuff in the folks don't know, I do a sort of a quick um, auction auction listing and um, eBay sold listing review. Uh, so, but I'll let you answer Ms. Barrow as best you can. Well, I, I think that they're in good hands with you because I know you have a lot of uh, market knowledge and antiques expertise. One of my favorite tips for people who may not want to invest in the kind of uh, specialized databases that I have to subscribe to as an appraiser is uh, if it's totally free to have a live auctioneer subscription. And live auctioneer is just requires an email. And so you, it aggregates many, many different auction houses. And it's also you know fun just to see where certain things are in the market. You can type in whatever type of object it is and then click past, past auctions and all of the results come up and you can sort them by the highest price. You can sort by most recent sales. So I actually use that a lot for items that aren't art. For art, I mainly use Art Price, which is a paid database for fine art sales, but live auctioneers for kind of most general decorative arts 
in, in some furniture it is very useful for aggregating a lot of different auction houses. There are other uh, ones like Bid Square and Invaluable. There, you know, Barnaby's. I usually use a couple when I'm doing my reports, but one that's absolutely free and you don't have to pay any money is Live Auctioneers. So that may be fun for you all to play around with if you want to <laughs> see what certain items are going for at auction right now. Great, thank you. Other questions? I'll look in the chat, check out the chat. I, I have another question, but I don't want to interrupt somebody else if they're interested in chiming in. Go ahead, um, I'll, take, I'll take a look around. Okay. Um, so another question is, I love that you say love your items and use your items, or maybe you didn't say use your items because my That's mother- true. I didn't, but I agree with you. <laughs> Yeah, my mother always said, don't worry about what the cost is. If you love it and it brings beauty and utility into your life, use it. And I remember when I had the task of setting the table at 12 years old. And of course, I took too big a stack of plates. And every single one of those plates broke when I tripped and, and, tripped huh? and fell. And yeah, and I've also had a recent occasion in which I loaded things very, very, very carefully into my car. And when I arrived, I opened the door and of course all the plates came out. And so, yes, <laughs> sorry, Sarah. <laughs> but I always try to remember my mother saying, what's most important is they're used and they're loved and don't worry about the cost, use, use them, enjoy them, don't keep them in cupboards. And so I live by that. But what that means is some of the most expensive um, you know, handed down furniture that I have, I use it. And I've had three little boys and you can imagine there are nicks and scratches. And I always hear different information. One is that you should never really do cosmetic repairs to things of great value because it decreases the value. And I've also heard, um, you know, you should get it repaired in order to use it even if you're not worried about the value, if you're not worried about the value. So just sort of broadly, where do you stand on that? Those are all such great points. And that's something that I really strongly believe in too. And so I'm sorry about your upsetting experiences, but I salute you for using these things. Cause I really, I really agree with you. I think that's so important. And I'll, I have a lot of thoughts on this. So I'll just kind of go in a very haphazard way, but to specifically answer your question about the furniture repair, I, I tend to be in the camp of do what you need to do in order to have it be an active and beloved part of your, your life. So there are certain, you know, very specific furniture pieces where, you know, if it's a museum quality thing, you may want to check with a conservator for their opinion or check with an appraiser for their opinion on what, if I do X, Y, Z thing to it, how is this going to impact the value? But generally speaking, most sensitive conservation does not detract from value. So it, it's where things haven't been done sensitively that that could possibly detract from value. Like I remember reading how Julianne Moore had uh, put polyurethane on her Nakashima coffee table. And I was just like, you could have put a different finish on it instead. You know, why polyurethane? So I would not have been on board with that decision, even though, I mean, honestly, I'm kind of being a hypocrite because that was what she needed to do in order to use it in her life. So I, I would have preferred if she'd oiled it, but you know, that that's her choice. It was her table. So I think that it, I am, I would so much rather people use and love things than have them be pristine. And often the situations where I'm, dealing with a family member and there's this, you know, item that a parent had that they have no emotional connection to. And I say like, oh, did you, did you bring this out for meals? No, I've never seen this. It's been in this closet for 40 years. You know, that makes me so sad because it's, it's something that clearly, you know, was treasured by someone because it was carefully stored away to keep it safe, but in keeping it safe, they then removed that opportunity to build all those memories where a loved one would treasure it in a, their own way. So I'm always, in, I mean, it, yeah, I, I wince as a person who loves objects when I see things get damaged, but I, I really think that it's, we, none of us can take it with us. So it's better to just enjoy it in, in its present. And if it's something that's extremely significant and rare and should be in a museum, you know, then you might consider donating that to a museum or selling it to a museum and having a coffee made that you can love and live with in your life. So it's not that I'm saying to destroy things that are, you know, extraordinarily significant objects, but for 
you know, like people's silver, people's China. I'm always, you know, encouraging people to use it, enjoy it, love it. And uh, when I work with uh, clients who've inherited things and they're like, but, but I have, you know, a full house already. I say, well, is there anything you can upgrade? You know, do you, is there something that's just basic that you can switch it out with this very cool thing and, you know, have this be your every day. And you're like, wow, I could upgrade, you know? So that's another great way to fold beautiful things in. I find that, and I am guilty of this myself. I, you know, we kind of play small with what we feel we're worth, you know, and in, in the things we surround ourselves with. So, you know, it's, if you have a, a house full of things that you're trying to deal with that you've inherited from a loved one, you know, you don't have to keep everything, certainly not, but there are things that you can switch out and they would really elevate your daily life and you would enjoy using them and they make you think about somebody you really care about I wholeheartedly support that. And so right. I mean, I've even had uh, people say, well, you know, if I put this, you know, this in the dishwasher, it is going to hurt it. Yes. If you put the sterling in the dishwasher over time, you're, you're going to notice that it's going to hurt it, but you have to weigh is using, enjoying using it going to be, you know, what's your cost benefit. And I can't make that decision for people, but it's, I encourage people to think about that. I appreciate that. And we do have one question that showed up in the uh, chat. Um, I, I hesitate to identify at all because the question is, we think we might have a Wyeth. What do, how do we start finding out about that? And of course, I'll tell you, um, I don't think it's a Wyeth. Let's put it in the auction. No. Um, <laughs> but, but, so, so where would you start with that? Would you, would you, for, now we've got it identified as, oh, this might be a Wyeth. Do you look, do you, would you start with an appraiser? Would you start with something like the Wyeth Museum? Um, what, what would you suggest? Well, first, my first question would be, which one, father or son? And uh -huh. that, that uh, in usually the kind of work that we do as appraisers involves reaching out to the foundation or the museum or checking to see, is it in the catalog? Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> Father, yes. Uh, I, I the, actually the first article I ever wrote for Worthwhile Magazine when we launched it was about how to use a catalog resume, because that is such a great resource for collectors, particularly if they want to go deep on a certain artist to help make sure that they're investing in pieces that are you know recognized as authentic by by the authorities on that artist. And so, catalog resume is, uh, and not every artist has a catalog resume, but a catalog resume is. The, uh, it's a book that include, or increasingly they're going to online websites, which I think is a great move because they're so much more accessible that way. It's all of the recognized artworks by certain artists that the authorities who are the scholars of this artist are saying, yes, you know, this artist made this piece. And so if something isn't in the catalog resume, that's a big red flag. Occasionally something will surface that just hasn't been included in the catalog resume because it was, you know, in a private collection for 60 years. And then uh, it goes to the arbiters of the catalog resume and they, they decide and they say, okay, we're either going to add this to the catalog resume or we don't think this should be included because of this reason or this reason or this reason that we don't think this is an authentic work. So in the instance, uh, in your specific instance, my recommendation would be to, to go to the, the foundation because there you know, is a, a very well-established organization for that specific artist and check against the catalog resume for whatever the medium is and, and then kind of move from that point forward. So I'm happy to assist you with that if you want to reach out to me in the future, but that, that really is the first step. And then, then depending on what they say, then you might want to get <laughs> some insurance <laughs> coverage for that. <laughs> I saw Liz had her hand up um, as well for another question, that, but we did get a question about where you start with China and silver. Oh, sure. And uh, with the catalog resume article, sure, I can, uh, in a second, I can pull that up and, and put that in. It's also on my website. If you go to my website, the expertise tab, I basically have every article I've ever written on there. So, <laughs> and they're all hyperlinked. So there's a lot, a lot to read if you're curious, but uh, for China, silver and crystal, the, it, depending on the level of the market, it, I don't know if this question is regarding uh, downsizing or up insurance. If it's insurance, I would probably concentrate on the silver because that's where the current uh, market, where a lot of the, the val value, okay, for downsizing and activity is. 
silver plate is not selling all that well. Sterling is. I actually, uh, one of my pandemic projects was I made a self-paced online course about how to tell whether you have sterling silver or silver plate and kind of how to identify uh, typical silver marks for people because I, I wasn't able to go out on site and meet with people to, to do what I usually do and teach them how to read their silver. So I, I made an online course for that. That's You can get that on my website too. But for downsizing, those are tricky object categories. I find that crystal and china, unless it's something like Floridanica, are not generally selling all that well. So that's certainly, uh, there. I know that there are some uh, local uh, DC area uh, kind of boutique uh, stores that, that do take items on consignment where they, they might do quite well. I'm sure Bruce is going to say, or you could donate it to, to our charity auction. <laughs> Yes, but, he uh, is. Yeah, and we pick uh, up. We pick yeah, up. Yeah, and uh, we got some Indian tree, a very nice set of in, spode Indian tree coming the way of anybody who wants to bid enough on it soon. <laughs> oh, thank, thanks, Bruce. Uh, yes, perfect. You you pulled up the catalog, isn't it? That was that. I told I told you we had a a good one on a a sleeper on the hand, and that Roxanne Walker sent it right to me. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous, but uh. I know that replacements uh, limited. Uh, if you right. they have a free form where if you put in what you have and send pictures, they'll write back with what they'll buy it for. That depending on what it is, it may not always be cost effective because you of course have to get it to North Carolina. So the shipping is part of that. And then I have never actually sold anything through replacements, but what clients have told me is that they they purchase for a whole lot less than they sell for. So I once had a client who she had driven up from the south to deal with her father's estate, which was in, in this area. And he happened to have had five separate huge China services. And none of them were, were patterns that were going to do all that well in the market at present. And so we were trying to figure out what she could do with them. And it dawned on me, I said, are you driving back through North Carolina? <laughs> because <laughs> he was driving right past the replacements headquarters. <laughs> so she was so excited because, you know, she didn't have to pay for shipping or anything. So I think that I, I wasn't involved in that, but I'm pretty sure that's what she did. So if you happen to have a North Carolina trip planned in the future, that, right. that may be something to consider. But otherwise, uh, I... I it, those are object categories that are a little tricky. If it's sterling silver, so, and especially depending on what it is, like Tiffany always sells well, you know, and, and the market for sterling in general has gone up with the pandemic. It's sort of plateaued a little bit now, but it uh, really spiked with the pandemic because people- We, we do have a number of auction houses in the area that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. Wexler's, uh, Potomac, Quinn's, um, Sloan's. Um, without getting you into any recommendations unless you feel you'd like to. There's also some pretty high-end consignment stores. I want to get Liz's question in before we finish up, but I also, if you could, I think for a lot of folks in our situation, we're, we might want to play around with eBay a little bit, but you gotta, you got to pack that stuff up and <laughs> You, you got to then you got to pay for the shipping and figure out the shipping. You know, you could put it, Craigslist is very, very boomer right now it is not what folks are doing and the neighbor, <laughs> neighborhood stuff is more complicated so consignment stores and auction houses are an easy way for our group to deal with things could you talk about a little bit about how uh, choosing between those two options and and what the process it is sure i i for diplomacy's sake i am not going to give any specific about any specific venues. What How about I geography? <laughs> or Alexandria? My zips, <laughs> lips and field. What I actually truly do recommend to people is, especially since it's so easy with digital photographs, I always recommend people, you know, reach out to a couple different venues they're interested in and just see how the chemistry feels. Because, you know, you may have a, a contact at, at one venue that you really have a good working relationship with and you feel comfortable working with, and you may just not have the same chemistry at a different venue. And so I find that it, I, what I just, rather than saying, go here, go here, because that I really, that's not something that I feel comfortable doing in my business because I don't have any relationships with any venues. I'm totally independent, but I do feel it's really helpful for people to just to see where the chemistry feels right for them. And the chemistry for different people may feel right at different venues. And then in doing that, you'll get a, you know, a range of pre-sale estimates. You'll get be able to review contracts. 
you know, there may be differences in what the outcome would be for you financially, depending on the different venues. And yeah, check out, you know, the, some of the high-end consignment shops too, if you have items that are, would be well suited for their inventory. So I, my kind of main philosophical approach is the, that comparative shopping <laughs> approach and just really listen to your intuition on what you feel comfortable with. Okay, thank you. Liz? Okay, you final question, final question. So um, I have a steamer trunk full of um, a few canceled, but many uncanceled uncan stamps from turn of the century. Um, I have no idea and no interest in getting them appraised, but I would like them to get them in the right hands and have somebody enjoy them who's a stamp collector. Um, any thoughts about that? Sure, I do not appraise stamps. The uh, only expert I'm aware of who does appraise stamps his, is an appraiser in Pennsylvania. His name is Richard Kohlberg, and I can uh, send his contact information to Bruce to forward to you, Liz, or feel free to reach out to me. But he, okay. he would be able to assist you with that, I think. I, and then I'm going to put in my how to use a catalog resume article here because I managed to Google it in time. <laughs> so... That way, uh, if you all are, I kind of take people through it step by step because it's actually a little complicated to know how to use some of them if, if you've never done it before. Uh, Liz, I, I, I'm typing it out for other people, but I, I had a friend ask about stamps. I don't know. I know FDR collected stamps. That's all I know. Um, but to some of the lo local stamp collectors clubs, the philatist societies would would you would, you might have someone snatch them out of your hands very quickly. It also might be a, a place to start to say, so how, how, how do I get these off to um, a charity auction or- um, <laughs> I see where you're going with that. <laughs> or, 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 uh, yeah, um, or some, somewhere, uh, I think the Stamp Collectors Clubs are a place that you can start and find out what they have to say. That's very helpful. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I'd also suggest there's a really nice postal museum up by Union Station, and they might need, um, they might have a way to display those for a wider audience even. That's a great idea. That's a great, great. idea. Right? There's so much trash in there, though, I'm sure that they may not even want to take the collection. It's a steamer trunk full. Whoa. Um, wow. That, that's exciting, actually. They're, they're, maybe not on this one, but uh, yeah, so, so, some little stamp liquor <laughs> would be excited to hear that. That I'd love to work with you on figuring out how we do that. Uh, let me scroll through and see anybody raising their hand visually for me to see before we say thank you and uh, so long, farewell. Uh, Vida Zane, adieu. Liz, I put... Uh... Richard Kohlberg's information in the chat for you. I just got it. Thank you so much. And and the, the Margaret Hines who's on here, I sent you a chat. If you ever worked for the DC government as I did, I'd be delighted to connect back up with you. All right. Um, thank you very much. This has been very interesting. Again, very I do remind, go whet your appetite by looking at what's on the um, uh, website already. More things are coming. And if you've got things that Ms. Sparrow, I would love to talk to you about that your things and helping helping you decide how to price them or just have fun with it this has been really helpful thank you so much sarah I mean, we, thank you so we, much. we will make available your um your contact information for those who who haven't already um copied it down thank you thank you so